I have had the pleasure of introducing a lot of people in my life, but this one is a true honor. It's uh, somebody who's become not just a friend to sheriffs, but I think to a lot of the causes that we're talking about. Kellyanne Conway needs really no introduction about who she is, but let me tell you some things you may not know. And if you do, good on you. She's a mother of four children, wonderful children. But she's also one of the president's closest and most important advisors on a day-to-day -day basis. I didn't know this until about three months ago. She's a recovering lawyer. <laughs> Her mind works like a lawyer's, as you all know, you see it frequently. Where you see her, when you see her is really not important, but what you know now is that she is the president's staff person that is driving the results and solutions to this epidemic. And I do know this from my own personal discussions with her because the president did name her to this. A little over a year and a half ago, the president had a few of us in the Oval Office and he said, you know, I need sheriff's help. I need you to carry this flag. I need you to go out and bring these people together. I need you to use that bully pulpit. And it's not just law enforcement. Bring all of the community together. I met with Kellyanne shortly after that, and I talked to her about it, and she said, go, we have your back. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great honor to introduce to you Kellyanne Conway. Thank you so much, that is very kind. And I remember and have reflected many times on that initial meeting, it was probably two weeks after we arrived at the White House and we convened a round table with some sheriffs from across the country and I remember very specifically hearing from a number of them that one of the most grueling day-by-day -day fights they were waging within their communities, and these are very ge geographically and, and demographically disparate areas, different from each other, is in fact the drug demand and the opioid crisis. And with that, the president, in very short order, as is his usual speed and direction, he put together a presidential commission on battling the opioid epidemic and the drug demand drug supply crisis, headed up by now former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, a bipartisan commission that included a former Democratic congressman, Patrick Kennedy, himself a very, very vocal, advocate of mental health parity and a recovering addict himself as he refers to it. And we had we had on that commission Dr. Bertha Madras from Harvard, we had Democratic Governor Roy Cooper of North Carolina, Republican Governor Charlie Baker of Massachusetts. And that commission met several times, all public, and we heard from people across the country, including law enforcement and other people who are in charge of the interdiction, but also people who are in charge of recovery and treatment, of education and prevention, the whole of government approach. The commission completed its work on December 1st. It issued a 56-point recommendation over 100 pages long, public document, if anyone wants to read it. And if you haven't heard much about it, you should think about what gets covered this day and what doesn't because as you know, this really affects your communities and our nation at large. Those 56 recommendations fall into nine broad categories. As I say, the President of the White House has accepted is on the way to implementing them. A few of them got implemented almost instantly because they were a matter of a rules change or a proclamation. I'll get to those in a moment. But it shows you the swiftness with which the President has tried to tackle this. Also, the president has, yes, he has designated me as a convener, a convener, a communicator, a coordinator, so that we have a whole of government approach. We meet on a weekly basis with about 10 or 12 cabinet departments and agencies. This is the second time, the first time was with taxes, which went well, and opioids is really the second major issue in this White House where that is being done, we call it the opioids cabinet. And essentially just means bringing together principles in each of those agencies so that we are communicating with each other and finding ways to make progress on the agenda, substantively. I also appreciate that the folks who represent the cabinet departments and agencies, along with those of us at the White House, are in touch with people who are in touch with the people most in need. So it's fabulous that you have the power of the presidency, the White House, the whole administration focused on this. But we believe, and make no mistake, we believe that those closest to the people in need know best how to service them. 
You, the crisis may be very familiar to each of you, but how best to tackle it in your respective communities is very unique to those communities, and we trust you, and yes, we do have your backs. We also have $6 billion in new funding from Congress, a historic amount of funding that was, um, that was put forth about six weeks ago in the omnibus, and the President um, did tout that in the diplomatic room, uh, publicly, live, on TV, talking about the $6 billion in opioid funding, $4 billion for school safety, $700 billion for the military. He made very clear he didn't like a lot of what was in there, but very happy that we've got more funding than any administration has ever realized in any uh, one piece of legislation. That helps the President and his administration and all of us fight this on three major fronts. And we are tackling these fronts simultaneously, not sequentially, because we need to do all of them at the same time. They're all really part of the urgent priority and part of the solution set. So in no particular order, that's education and prevention, treatment and recovery, and third, law enforcement and interdiction. So with respect to education and prevention, we are working arduously to try to get this in the curriculum, or really to develop a curriculum that would be easy for folks to use in their respective communities. Um, also, the after-school programs, weekend programs, community-based, faith-based programs we know have worked in the past when we're trying to communicate with the broader public about an urgent, and in this case, public health emergency, as has been declared. Also, in terms of the prevention education, is the President's call to reduce prescriptions for new opioids by 30% over the next three years. And we paid we paid attention um, rapidly two weeks ago or so when the report came out that prescriptions were down about 10% over the last year. I think that's due in no small part to the President's efforts and the efforts of others. Communication, these prescription drug monitoring programs are working. They're impressive. I know all but one state has them, but you even have some communities and municipalities developing some of their own organically. That's been a big help. To have the Veterans Administration be the first hospital system in our nation to publish its opioid prescriptions has been incredibly helpful in terms of transparency and accountability and just coordination. Um, regrettably, we do recognize that that for some of our veterans, um, in our in our quest to make sure they have everything they have, everything they need, sometimes they're handed um, too much of the of the opioids. And I've heard that from them directly. I've traveled around the country. I've seen examples like in Cleveland at the VA, where pain management need not always automatically mean pain medication. They're they're certainly using other protocols as are other places. And uh, so also. The Prevention education, I can keep talking about that, but I'm going to move on. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is we are on the cusp of announcing a major national public-facing advertising campaign. And you'll be surprised, I think, and fairly heartened by whom our partners are in that um, small C campaign. But we want to get the message out. Ladies and gentlemen, America doesn't know what fentanyl is, and you do. You know how it's crushing your communities and worse taking away loved ones um, every single day across this country. 20,000 deaths attributed to fentanyl in 2015. And I would tell you, as I said before, and I've said to the President directly, if, if 20,000 people were dying from, God forbid, plane crashes or domestic terrorism, we would all stop whatever we're doing and focus on it. So I think in part the President is recommending that we stop what we're doing in part and focus on it. And indeed we are as a nation, and we appreciate you very much for being on the front lines of that. Um, for, uh, treatment and recovery. So medication-assisted therapy is uh, recommended in the commission's report that's been accepted by the president. We hear from health professionals. It is an effective mode of treatment for many of those, of those who are already addicted, already misusing. In addition, these rule changes, um, the IMD waivers, the 1115 waivers that are, that are being granted now by Administrator Seema Verma at CMS, and uh, Secretary Azar at HHS, when we met with the governors at the White House probably six or eight weeks ago, said to them, we received five, or, we've been granting five or six waivers, but we implore you to apply for your waivers because that's how you open up that 17th plus bed in these facilities that have bed space and long waiting list, but are denied Medicaid reimbursement if you get past that, seventh, that 16th bed. 40-year-old rule, 40-year-old ban, that we need to bust through. The president has suggested a federal waiver. He's asked Congress to look at a blanket federal waiver. 
The HIPAA clarification is through the Office of Civil Rights at, at, um, at HIPAA and HHS. They, they clarified the HIPAA, the crisis exception, about six or seven months ago, saying that if, you're, if, if your loved one has overdosed and thankfully has been resuscitated, you can know that without violating their HIPAA, their, their privacy rights under HIPAA, because there's a crisis exception. I'm one small molecule in this entire big effort, and I've met too many people. Too many grieving parents and loved ones who lost, and you know, young people who lost a parent or grandparent who had no idea, no idea that loved ones were, were misusing opioid prescriptions and other um, other drugs. And yet they are told that you know we're so sorry, Mr. 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 Smith, Mr. Mrs. Smith, we resuscitated Johnny five times in this emergency room this year, but the sixth time he was too far gone, and they say who, mom, where, when. So this should go a long way. We, love, we would love to implore you to help us even get basic messages like that. If people don't know what fentanyl is, why it's dangerous, that it's 50 times as lethal as heroin, 100 times more lethal, more potent, I should say more potent than morphine. And then turning to your bailiwick, law enforcement interdiction. I'm sure you've heard, I think, Secretary Nielsen is here today, Attorney General Sessions, so that's, those are real treats for you. Uh, we appreciate the fact that our law enforcement and our interdiction feels better resourced and better respected in this fight. $98 million grants from DOJ to back the, additional grants to back the blue, the J code, uh, shutting down the dark net, the Alpha Bay dark net sales. Obviously, all the work that the Department of Justice is doing with respect to the MS-13 gangs and other folks in DHS to disrupt the flow of illicit drugs into our country. When the president talks about the wall, when he talks about sanctuary cities, yes, he's talking about people, but he's also talking about the poison. He's talking about keeping the poison out of our communities. And just as I've been told by people on the ground in law enforcement in New Hampshire over the last two years, that wow, we have these problems that just drugs are nesting in sanctuary cities across the border in Massachusetts and being driven over the border here in New Hampshire. Lo and behold, there was a big bust a couple weeks ago in one of those uh, places in Massachusetts. So you see what's happening in the big, the big fentanyl busts, um, the disruption of the illicit flow, the, the idea that law enforcement, CPB, Customs and Border Patrol is getting an additional $9 million now for the Interdict Act. Interdict is an acronym. And that is legislation that passed the House 412 to 3 and passed the Senate unanimously on either a voice vote or through consent, but we'll take it. And in a town that's incredibly divided, in a country that's divided, in a town that tells us we can't do anything else because it's an election year, we don't really hear that message. We like to go back to not so long ago, December, when interdict, the Interdict Act was passed and signed into law by the President in the Oval Office on January 9th, and he was flanked by Republicans and Democrats from the House and the Senate. He handed the pen to Democratic Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, whose wife last Friday the dinner showed me the front page of the Boston Globe. I mean, people get really excited when they feel they can work on a nonpartisan issue such as this in a bipartisan fashion. That's precisely how we regard the issue. I certainly do. Very happy that just this week it was announced that um, there the both the the announcement by um, acting director Jim Carroll, deputy director of ONDCP Jim Carroll, talking about brand new HIDA, the first HIDA program in, since 2001, and since we'll be in Juneau, Fairbanks, and the Anchorage, Alaska area, that will complete all 50 states of having HIDA. And that is fabulous because we value the work of, of HIDA uh, and everything that goes on there to um, really study and analyze and and help bend the curve in the right direction with respect to the production, transportation, and distribution of these drugs. A lot of that money also in that work goes towards the tribes, something that uh, Secretary Zinke and others have been on the front lines. So you might expect that our whole government approach would include the VA and HHS and all the sub-cabinet agencies, obviously NIH and FDA and Surgeon General's Office and CMS and so forth. And you might expect it would include DHS and DOJ, but also those USDA. See our friends here from USDA, they've been absolutely terrific in offering guidance to rural America and convening roundtables with farmers and others. Um, Secretary Purdue and his team have been terrific on this issue. 
as has been Secretary Acosta at Labor, Secretary Carson and his team at HUD. And the reason I mention those cabinet departments and agencies is they're not intuitively involved to many people when you talk about this. And I want you to know they are very involved. We believe in treating the whole person. And we know, we know far too often that if somebody is fortunate enough to go through a drug court program, fortunate enough to come out on the other side as a winner of a drug treatment program, that sometimes when they return to the familiar environment, the thing most familiar to them is the drugs. And that if there are housing opportunities, if there's workforce development opportunities, employment opportunities, skills training and education, we want to be able to connect desire and need with opportunity. And so this is a president who has said we dignify all types of work. We believe in skills education as well. And as well as for your colleges and eight and postgraduate degrees and all the fancy kinds of expensive things people like me paid for. Uh, I, where I grew up, most people ended up having vocational education, community college, and they have to be able to support themselves with the real skills, skills that I lack to this day. So it's, it's, um, it's to be lauded. And housing and urban development, doing a great job there. You're doing a great job with respect to mental health and homelessness and drugs, all that working together. So it is a whole of government approach, and we're very happy that um, law enforcement and tradition is a very big part of it. Finally, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, one thing that we're doing at the White House called crisisnextdoor.gov. It's a website, you can pull it, crisisnextdoor.gov. And this is the place where we want Americans to share their stories. Dr. Ramadas, our Surgeon General, shared his story. Eric Bowling, who lost his son, Eric Chase, last time, shared his story. Dallas Strawberry, former MLB player, has shared his. But we're really imploring very recently, because you can pull it up very recently, there's a very I think, compelling and persuasive and heart-wrenching story by a woman in law enforcement. And she talks about law enforcement but then she quickly goes into the story of her own daughter who she lost to drug addiction. But we're asking people to share their stories to try to break the stigma and silence that tends to drug use and drug overdose and drug addiction, which we know, unfortunately, is a bigger cause of death now than gun violence and um, accidents and um, domestic terrorism, plane crashes and the rest. And for the second year in a row, we had life acceptance expectancy decreased, even though we made so many strides as a country health-wise, but it's decreased two years in a row because of this, I mean, only in large part because of this. So uh, this also kills more people than breast cancer. That was a big uh -huh, wake-up statistic for many people who didn't really know how to articulate or put a number around this. That really Chris, um, will train the mind. I, I think what I want to also say is that uh, we are, we like to hear your best practices. It's so easy to hear the tales of woe and the heartbreaking stories and those were important. But we're all about solutions. We're all about bending the curve in the right direction. Our eyes are wide open. We didn't get here overnight, we're not going to come out of it overnight. But we feel the whole of government at the federal level and then the whole of government that's horizontally, then the whole of government vertically, federal, state, and local, incredibly important. Very, the increasing number of Americans are stakeholders in this crisis next door. But I believe that all Americans are shareholders in the crisis next door, and that they have a vested interest in becoming involved. Got great news that came to my desk yesterday. Maybe some of that I shared with you, but worth repeating. We already know that last National Take Back Day in October, two days after the President and First Lady gave their joint policy address in the East Room, and then the President tweeted about and did his national, excuse me, his weekly radio address to amplify what he had said as part of his formal remarks in the East Room that take back days when you just bring your unused, expired, unneeded drugs to any of these, you know, take them to the pharmacies, take them to law enforcement places, here are some drop offs. Since that time, we've had some really great help from tech communities, from other faith based and independent organizations. Google Maps did a whole, did a whole map locator for us, um, showing people where they could go. And, and bring back their unused, unneeded, expired drugs. They also recently committed $5 million for an campaign to the site, and others are as well. But um, we, we as a nation, collected the DEA, of course, who's in charge of that program. Last October, collected 900,000 pounds. 900,000 pounds, ladies and gentlemen, these tiny little pills is just an enormous amount. It's just incredible to strain the mind to think of that. Enough to fill a 3757 Boeing aircraft. And 
I got the uh, preliminary results yesterday, they were probably closer to about 943,000 pounds this time. So an even higher amount. And it's all because the message is getting out there. It's all because we all become resources for people. I think it costs next to nothing to just communicate those messages. So yes, we're all for the fancy, you know, big digital slash network TV cable station ad campaigns, but sometimes it's as simple as the rule changes I talked about are as simple as making sure people are connected with the information they need and they want. Um, Google and Facebook tell us that the most popular searches about opioids is what is no good. Or is excellent opioids, oxycontin opioid, is Tylenol opioid. You have to start at the beginning on this, really. Because it is the crisis next door, and people, they know the crisis, they know the, the death and the hurt and the loss and the devastation of the crisis more than they know the cause. They know the effect more than they know the cause. They know the problem more than they know the solution. So my final message to you on behalf of the President and the First Lady, on behalf of the White House, on behalf of all of us here um, administration-wide is to thank you once again and to ask you to continue to be part of the solution. Thank you and God bless you.